thank you so much. Guys, I loved the sincerity of your worship. And uh, as you led us, Carly and all that group, beautiful. Mm, it's going to take me a minute to get past. Maybe I don't get past. We'll just dive in. Pray with me. Father, let's move ahead in this. Thank you. Thank you for the wind of worship at our backs. Thank you for the Spirit who is present. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God. Thank you for the people of your family and those who are seeking truth today in this room. Now be with us and guide us through this message. Help me to be authentic, and to be real, to be your voice, and to not get in the way of what you want to say. In Jesus' great name, amen. I have wrestled a lot with what the Bible says. I don't know. I think that the more I grow in it and understand it, the more I wrestle with it. And I think it's because I feel a little more secure uh, in God's Word. And by that I mean I used to not want to ask hard questions because I didn't know if the hard questions had good answers. You know what I mean? You push on something, you want to know it's solid. And I used to kind of tiptoe around hard things and read past obvious questions in the Bible. Now, I don't do that anymore, and I find a freedom in that. I find a great freedom. But I'm going to share one of those things with you that I think is kind of a, one of the verses that's pretty prominent. If you've been in, in this Christian journey very long, you've heard this. Uh, if you've been in church very often, you've probably heard this. But I want to read it in a new way today. I want to read it and just draw attention to the conflict, to the apparent contradiction that Jesus raises. It's in John, 10, John 16, 33, and, and the Scripture says... Uh, Jesus speaking said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. So peace is in view. Jesus has spoken words in that chapter. He said, I've told you all this so that you can have peace. And then the next words out of Jesus' mouth are this. In this world, you will have trouble. I've told you these things so you'd have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Now listen, I know the theological answer to this, okay? I'm not confused theologically and I don't think most of you are but I want to look at it from I want to back up and not just I'm not trying to take the spirit of God out of it or the authenticity of the word out of it but I just want to be distinctly human I know that I'm not just human that I'm indwelled by the Holy Spirit but I want to look at this from a human perspective and and see the obvious contradiction because I think Jesus meant to do that I think he meant to draw that stark apparent contradiction I've told you these things so you have peace but in the world you're going to have trouble well, see, in my mind, in my natural mind, I do this. I go, well, if I'm having trouble, how can I have peace? If I have trouble, how do I have peace? How can peace and trouble coexist? Because it's kind of like how can light and darkness intermingle? They don't. And in the flesh and the humanity side of me says peace and trouble don't mix. Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? I've told you these things so you can have peace. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. And then he says, take heart. I've overcome the world. He's promising that we're going to experience trouble, but he's promising that he can give us peace. And then Paul just confounds this further in, in 1 Thessalonians when he says to rejoice always. Always rejoice. It says it in Philippians 2, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice over and over. Not sometimes, not when the stars align perfectly and there's only a minimal amount of trouble in your life, but rejoice always all the time regardless of your circumstances and so Jesus is saying have peace all the time regardless of your circumstances and I just you know I kinda go ah that doesn't make sense not from my perspective not from the fleshly body that I stand in the suit of flesh that I live in and here's what I wanna do I wanna invite you along with myself again to be bold enough today to to not just stick a theological band-aid on this problem the problem of the apparent contradiction of peace and trouble coexisting and somehow inhabiting the same moment and time in my life. Because I don't get that. I mean, I just can't logically explain that to you. I don't function that way. Maybe you do. Maybe that just, just works for you. But what I want to avoid today is just hearing this like a church member, like a, like a good Baptist. I want to take all that back and just say, I know you're a good church member and good Baptist, but I hope you're, you're honest enough. And I don't care if you're a good Baptist or not, really. I just want you to follow Jesus. But I hope you're honest enough to say, man, I didn't really, you're right. I never thought about it. Just kind of read through that and say, well, I guess that's true. But is it true for you? Does it make sense to you? Let's wrestle with that this morning because I think that the beauty of it 
And, that, and that's not our, even our main verse, but I think the beauty of the apparent contradiction is where the peace comes from. It's where the richness of Jesus' words come from. Because uh, th- let, me, let me walk you through some thoughts, and, and they're hard. Just take, take a minute to stand in the shoes of someone who's facing a terminal illness or is dealing with the most uh, rebellious, catastrophic um, uh, or catastrophic, rebellious child that, that you can imagine, or someone who just got handed divorce paper, or someone who is drowning in, the, in an addiction to drugs or alcohol or pornography, and their world is just seemingly washing away. How do we walk up to a family member in Boston, one of those family members who lost a loved one, but just finished, finished across the finish line, and say, rejoice always? Uh, you know, from where I'm standing, that sounds cruel. It just doesn't appear to make any sense. So let's walk through that today, would you, with me? Just honestly. Just real, really honestly. What does this look like? What in the world is Jesus talking about here? Because I want to tell you, I want to assure you of something. I'm utterly convinced that this incredible message and this document this living breathing word is absolutely without error there's no contradiction in it if i find a contradiction in it i know by default it's my perspective that that skews it and brings about the contradiction i'm i'm banking my eternal destiny on the on the infallibility of this word so i'm not up here saying hey i got a lot of questions about god's word i'm i'm skeptical about it i'm what i'm doing is i'm saying i know this is true but i want to wrestle with the with the honest questions that come to a human heart as we dig in to an infallible inerrant immovable living word i, I don't think we're going to get anything out of it today if we don't do that if we don't get really really honest so i'm going to ask you a very honest question that we hope to answer and even in the minutes remaining here it is do you believe it's possible to find peace do you believe it's possible I didn't ask you if you had but do you think it's possible to find peace and enjoy fellowship with Jesus when the circumstances of your life not just world but the circumstances of your life are anything but enjoyable. Can you enjoy Jesus when the circumstances of your life are not enjoyable? Or is that just a theological thing we throw out and say, hey, rejoice always, even when life stinks. I mean, even when you lose a loved one at the end of the Boston Marathon and and all of a sudden they're out of your life, rejoice. Hey, man, just rejoice. And I'd probably punch you if I was one of those family members and you walked up to me and said, rejoice always, consider it all joy. I mean, probably really would just maybe take you out. Because that doesn't, that doesn't set well with. So what do you do with it? Let's walk through it. Let's walk through it. Here's what Jesus said. Would you stand in the honor of reading Psalm 23 and verse 5? Psalm 23 and verse 5. We stand not out of ritual, not out of habit, not because I just want to wake you up. It's not a tactic. We want to revere and honor the word that Jesus has given us. And here's what David said. If you're not familiar, if you haven't been here, uh, we're walking through Psalm 23 pretty methodically and even verse or phrase by phrase. Here's the phrase today, verse 5, the first part of it. And David says, you prepare, speaking of the Lord as his shepherd, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You prepare, Jesus, you prepare a table before me in the presence of of my enemies father the irony in that statement is far greater than we're gonna get but it is in that conflict it is in the colliding of those two concepts of a table of fellowship and the presence of our enemies that we find the rich deep truth of what you came to reveal to us so help us today to be there to be okay to be there Lead us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. The shepherd and the sheep. It's our analogy. We're digging it out of David. King David is walking us through his understanding of his relationship with God and and, and correlating it to a relationship of the shepherd and the sheep. 
That's what he's doing. He's, he's making us understand some things about God from the perspective of a shepherd and the perspective of sheep because David was a shepherd. So he gets this really, really well. I mean, he's speaking authentically. And, the, and here's today we're, we're talking about, and in, in really the psalm is continuous journey and, and pictures the life of a shepherd and the role of a shepherd and the responsibility of a shepherd. And last week we said, even it talked about the verse that said, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And we talked about what that meant was the shepherd taking the sheep from their winter range, ascending the mountain through a valley or, or via a valley or a cut up to the top of the mountain where the sheep would spend their summer on the alpine meadows above the timberline and that, that often that was the best way, the valley was the best way to get to the destination they needed to go to, remember? But it was also the, the most dangerous way and at times the most difficult way, but it had the water, it had the food, it had the shade, it had everything, but it had predators, had prey, and, and David drew on that analogy and said, even though I walk through that valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, you're, you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And today he says... Once we reach that place, once we get to the Alpine Meadows, once we get to the, to the table tops on the mountains, in fact, the word for table here is the word that was often used to describe those flat uh, uh, pasture lands on top of the mountain. The Spanish word we use today is mesas, and, it, and, it, and it's the word for Spanish word for table. Same word that David's using here says, you prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemy. So that's the word that he uses for table. It's most often used to describe that. It's the exact word in the, in, the, in the Hebrew language. So these places were places of lush forage. They were places that were uh, returned to time after time. And uh, here's the, the significant thing. is they would go up the valley to these places, the shepherd would build temporary crude pens for the sheep and he would leave them for a short time as he would go on these short preparatory excursions to the mesas, to the tabletops, to what? To prepare them for the arrival of the sheep. Because the journey up the mountain didn't take three hours. It was a long journey, and, it, and they took their time. It was, and, the, and, and throughout that journey, the, the shepherd would leave, and again, he'd go to the tabletop, to the mesas, to the flatlands on the top of the mountain, to the alpine meadows, and he would prepare them for the arrival of of the sheep. Now here's just a few things that, that uh, Philip Keller talked about that a ship, shepherd would typically do in those preparatory excursions. He would pull out all, all the noxious weeds. Uh, there were a couple of specific ones that I'm not going to dare to try to remember or pronounce, but that a shepherd even in Jesus' day or David's day would know would be, very, would be particularly harmful to the sheep, especially to the young sheep, to the lambs. They were noxious weeds that would cause all kinds of bloating and swelling and, and uh, oftentimes lambs eat them and would, would literally die from those. So he would spend a lot of time uh, on their hands and knees picking out the potential poisonous weeds that would be indistinguishable for a sheep but very apparent to the shepherd. Keller talked about bringing his kids to do that and, and how tedious it was. Can you imagine? It's like weeding a massive garden. Uh, it just was, it was a lot of fun. He would sing songs to him and keep him entertained as he would do that. But David would, uh, David did the same thing. He was up there preparing the mountaintop for the sheep's arrival. Another thing they would do is, because they were flatter areas, a lot of times they would dig out pools for watering. Uh, and they would be, like I said, these were seasonal places they would come back to. So most of the time, if the pools were dug, they would go back up and get all the debris that had filled in to the pool and clear out the pool so that the snow melt could uh, actually fill up those with clean, clear water. You've probably seen stagnant pools where leaves and debris have sat in them and it, and it turns, it stains the water and makes it stagnant and, and not drinkable. So he'd do that. He would also oftentimes bring a supply of salt and minerals with him uh, and, 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 and go store those ahead of time so that they would have those, especially in places where those minerals were uh, not naturally occurring. And then most significantly, perhaps most significantly, he would note any potential dangers uh, and prepare accordingly. Specifically, he would look for places where the sheep would be vulnerable to attack from predation. While you're in, in alpine territory, we're above timberline, there's still brush, there's still draws, there's still ravines. And listen, what does a predator do but follow prey? That's how predators make their living. 
That's how they survive. They go where the food source is. So predators being keen and very adaptable would know that as the sheep moved up the mountain, they would know where the, they remember. And they would lay in wait in an ambush. And so the shepherd's job was to go and make sure to take note of those potential ambush spots to keep and guard the sheep so that the sheep could eat on the tabletop uh, well prepared for them in peace. Even though the predators were going to be there, it wasn't an eradication program. The shepherd didn't go up there and, you know, and take out all of the, all of the uh, wolves or lions or whatever were there or bears. It didn't do that. They, he prepared it in the presence of the enemy. So you see this incredible correlation and in how David's mind is working and saying that's how God leads us. That's exactly how he does this. So, <clears throat> the shepherd was going to be so prepared <clears throat> for their arrival on these mesas that the sheep could totally relax, even though the presence of the predators was no doubt nearby. It's an amazing, amazing irony and a beauty in the contrast, especially when you go and look at it from the spiritual side of things. So let's do that. Our shepherd, Jesus, our good shepherd, the faithful one, who is no doubt leading some of you through the valley of the shadow of death, the deep, dark valleys, is making preparatory excursions ahead of you constantly to prepare the next phase of life, the next destination for you. Certainly, if we back up, we can see this in a bigger, you know, in a kind of a mega picture here where Jesus has gone physically into heaven to prepare, John 14 says, to, to prepare the ultimate mountaintop for us. Not that there's any enemy there, but he has gone ahead of us to prepare. But even in life now, remember that our shepherd does not just react to what comes up, but our shepherd always has foreknowledge, omniscience, and is prepared well for our arrival at any phase of life that we find ourselves. There's not a person in this room today who is in a phase of life or a set of circumstances or a situation or a difficulty where Jesus is going, how did we get here? I mean, my goodness, this is a mess. I wasn't ready for this. I have no idea how to deal with these problems. So y'all just hang out for a minute and I'll figure it out. But, you know, we treat Jesus like that. Like, we got to buy him some time because... We're in a mess, and he's not sure what to do, so we'll figure things out, and, and we'll pray, I guess. If we, and, and maybe by the time, you know, maybe I can buy some time so Jesus can get this straightened out. That never, ever happens in your life. You may feel that way. I know I've felt that way, but it doesn't happen. He's ahead of you. He's always ahead of you. He's never behind. His timing is without fail. Man, don't we live our lives like... Like uh, we live in a scramble of avoiding enemies, of, of avoiding problems. Like there's a destination where your enemy is not present. Do you got, ever, anybody ever found one of those places in life, a season in life, uh, uh, you know, a set of circumstances where there wasn't potential danger, where there wasn't potential problems or pitfalls, and we spend our lives trying to manage potential threats, which leaves us exhausted and depleted. We're just like the, the sheep who get up there, and they're like, we can't eat because we're afraid we're going to get attacked, and they could never relax. So Jesus prepares the table in the presence of our enemy. Not in the absence, in the presence. Because in this world, what? You're going to have trouble. Because there's an enemy Peter described our enemy very well. He said, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. Boy, he didn't pull any punches there, did he? He didn't say, let's say this kind of soft in case there's some young children around. He's, your enemy, the devil, is waiting to take you out. He is not playing games. He's not a kitty cat. He's a predator. And he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. See, uh, our shepherd, our shepherd Jesus, he does his job in the presence of the enemy. He does what he does in the presence of the enemy. What does he do? Well, we just saw. He said, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. Take note, you're going to have trouble in the world. And then we shut down like, oh, ah, ah, 
I can't get that. Wait, peace and trouble, they don't coexist. I've got to have peaceful circumstances to have a peaceful heart. And Jesus interrupts right there and says, no, you don't. In fact, you'll never have totally, completely peaceful circumstances. You're one doctor's appointment away, one phone call away, one car ride away, one pink slip away, one conversation away from potential what we would call devastation. And you and I live there. That's where we live. That's life. You're never going to get away from it. You're never going to find a, you know, a happy land on this world where potential threat, where the enemy is gone. It just doesn't exist. So we're exhausted today. So many people exhausted, spiritually depleted because we're running around looking for that place that doesn't exist. And we, we do not hear the beckoning call of the shepherd saying, come and rest in me. Be still and know that I am am God take heart I've overcome the world that's what Jesus said take heart parents you're exhausted from parenting you know and, and, then, and then we have young adults exhausted from trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do with my life we have people who are exhausted from financial debt. We have people exhausted from conflict in their relationships, from emptiness in their jobs. And we're looking for a land that doesn't exist. And all we have to do, literally, is find the shepherd. Because, listen, Jesus is all we need for peace to invade our lives. Jesus is all we need. Boy, that... I said it in the first service, say it now, that just sounds so trite. But I want to listen to it from a perspective that will allow it to sink in, and I want you to too. The presence of Jesus in your life is all that you would ever need to find and know and experience peace. Just, just Jesus. Because if that's not true, there are people in third world countries that the Bible could not possibly be true for because they don't have enough to eat. There are people that are in civil war today who do not know if they're going to live to the end of the day. There are people who hadn't eaten in weeks. There are people that don't have any clean water to drink. There are people who's, who have been raised without any parents who never knew their parents because they were murdered at an early age. If, we're, if, 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 if we've got to have peaceful circumstances to have peace, then Jesus just lied to most of the world. But we don't. And listen, by the way, you and I in the most prosperous land in the world, we know this. Prosperous does not equal peaceful. Abundance doesn't equal joy. We get it. Materialism, it doesn't take away the ache of broken relationships and, and emptiness inside. It doesn't do it, does it? It's like an anesthetic for a little while, but it doesn't, doesn't get at it. When Jesus... Our shepherd prepares times of rich fellowship with him. The enemy can only look on. That's all he can do. He can watch, but he's got nothing. But listen to this. For the sheep that says, hey, I think I've seen you do this enough. I'm pretty good. We had not had any problems. I'm going to go over here for a while. I'm going to leave the flock. I'm going to leave the shepherd. I can do this on my own. That sheep is instantly vulnerable and will not, will not survive. Not going to make it. Somebody just told me a very sad story. I'm a dog lover. And uh, it was Roger and Zanita. Or their, their neighbors left their little dog out the other night. They saw a brown streak come through the yard. The dog was gone. And a coyote had another meal. dog wasn't safe wasn't close enough but I promise you this is a perfect analogy if the owner was next to the dog and I certainly don't want to blame an owner I hope the owner is not here today or listens to this make sure they don't listen to this part but if they, had the owner been right next to the dog on a short leash coyotes are terrified of people they won't come it's the proximity that created the danger the dog got too far away it's the proximity in Jesus that our shepherd uh, 
it's our proximity to him that makes all the difference to how we experience the trials and the pitfalls and the devastation of life because it's coming the predators are there the enemy's present but jesus does go ahead of us he does advance the cause he is intentional about preparing times where we get to relax and enjoy him in rich fellowship and some of you are thirsting for that You've just not had that kind of fellowship with Jesus in maybe, maybe years and you've just been waiting like all the stars would line up and the circumstances would fall into place and you would just get to have that mountaintop experience where there's no enemy around. But listen, there is no such experience in this life. The enemy is present. So if he doesn't prepare a table in the presence of the enemies in this life, the table doesn't get prepared going to happen but if jesus is there if he is in the midst if he is your shepherd and he is then that's all we need see jesus will never be taken by surprise by the enemy by any enemy or adversity he'll never be ill prepared for our defense he'll never ever fall short in his ability to to, to take care of us but here's the deal we have to stay close People get in a mess, don't they? You know people in a mess where their lives are in shambles and they're, they're broken. And, and, and inevitably, whether they've talked to you or they've talked to me, inevitably I will find that somebody has strayed. And God's not zapping them. God's not saying, hey, I'm going to show you. for Here's how you get messed up. And I, you walk away from me and I'm going to get you. Just like a sheep that decides to stray away a little bit, take some freedom, they become vulnerable. And there's always an enemy waiting to take you out as God's people. Always. And they show up. And we give them counsel. And we tell them they can return. And they can. And that's the greatest news. But what we want to learn, what we want to learn right now, is don't walk away from the shepherd. Stay in relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking about how well you perform or whether you use a cuss word here or there or, or, or whether your, your thoughts are always perfectly pure or whether you attend every Bible study ever offered or whether you memorize scripture or whether you are a perfectly moral person. I'm not talking about all that stuff. I'm talking about your proximity to the shepherd because if you can get close, if you can stay in fellowship, if you can walk with Jesus, he will do the rest in your life that you need done. He'll take care of you in the meantime as well. He'll protect you. See, as, as a faithful as Jesus is, it's our responsibility to stay near him. That's our end. That's all we've got to do. And see, the sheep that strays from the shepherds is defenseless. It's going to fall victim to the enemy. I've read a couple articles lately and just saw some pictures. I didn't read the article, but it was, um, and I saw it on a... Um, Oh, it was probably a warden's or something on an outdoor channel. But some guys, several stories about people who have encountered grizzly bears. I'm fascinated with grizzly bears. I don't really want to encounter one, but I am fascinated with them. And all of their stories have this common theme, the ones that have been attacked, is I felt utterly helpless in the paws of that bear. Like a rag doll, they'll say. Like nothing would matter, no matter what I did, I'm defenseless. The thousand pounds of fury that descended upon them made them feel like they were as limp as a wet rag. Like you give it your best shot and you're powerless. And I don't want to give kudos to our enemy, that, that Satan. I don't want to pump him up. But I am telling you that you are defenseless against him apart from Jesus. Defenseless. Or Peter wouldn't have said your enemy is like a lion or that prowls around waiting to what? Devour you. Not mess with you, take you out, devour you. And you can't say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to armor up and I'm going to take on Satan. Because you can, you don't need to armor up and take on Satan. You need to just stay, you need to stay with Jesus. Absolutely put the armor of God on. But it, it, you can't, if you don't stay near Jesus, it doesn't matter what you got. The reality is when you put the armor on, that's what you're doing is you're staying near Jesus. So I get that. I just want to, I want to almost beg us to stay near to Jesus right now. What do you got to do to do that? What do you need to do to do that? In order to be in fellowship, to be near him, you got to perform well? Got to be super Christian? Do you got to 
You've got to do a certain amount of good deeds. What do you got to do? What do you mean stay near him? Then what do you need? Stay in fellowship with him. I am saying this. Let his word, this word, and his spirit that is always at work in this word saturate your life. Friends, I want to be brutally honest with you. If you're hitting this with a glancing blow in your life, <clears throat> and I'm guilty of this this week, so I'm indicting me right now. I hit this with a glancing blow this week. doesn't matter what I did last week. I hit this with a glancing blow. Okay, I can give you all kinds of excuses, but was, I was about to come down heavy on you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right, me too. If we are hitting this, let's change it to the we, with a glancing blow, we are not walking in fellowship with Jesus. Period. Well, my spirit is defending me right now, my fleshly spirit. Well, I know God's word. I've hit it in my heart. My goodness, I preach it every week, right? That's like saying, I, I filled up a month ago. Why do I need gas now? Why did I run out of gas? I filled up my tank a month ago. Well, you, need, you, you, you don't just fill up once, right? Do you? No. You got my truck. You fill up a lot. Over and over and over again. And it's expensive. This does cost you time. But you better fill up. You better stay in it. I didn't say figure it out and plumb the theological depths of revelation. I didn't say that. I just say get in the word. Let him speak to you. Let the spirit and the staff and the rod of the shepherd guide you through life to stay in fellowship. If you are not reading the word of God, if you're not a student of the Bible, you're not walking with Jesus. I didn't say you lost your salvation. I didn't say that. I said you are like the sheep. Belongs to the shepherd. Belongs to the flock that decided you would take a little excursion over here and guess who is over there guess what's going to happen over there every we're surprised well i strayed a little bit but i didn't do anything bad i'm a good person but you got taken out because you got an enemy that hates you and he wants to destroy your life and he's really good at it here's the deal even when we stray, this is the amazing thing about our shepherd. Even when we stray intentionally, we could, all, we, could, we could just say, Jesus, I've got this. I've hung out with you long enough. I, I know where I'm going. I know how to do this. I'm just going to live life on my own for a little while. I did that in college. I didn't actually know anything. But I, I decided that I could do this on my own. Decided I would step out in my first year or two of college and just kind of function on my own. It was terrible. Here's what I found out. Even when we stray, if we cry out for our shepherd, we're not going to hear, tough luck, shouldn't have left. Told you so. Here's what's going to happen. You cry out, he'll seek you out. He'll find you. He'll return to you. He'll rescue you. He'll forgive you. He is unfailing shepherd of your soul. You cry out right now. If you're in that place, in that wasteland of life, and you've been taken out by the enemy, and you're on your back, and you are cast down like a sheep, defenseless, belly up, nothing but vulnerability going on, and you realize that all you've got to do is say, Jesus, I need you. And I promise the shepherd of your soul will hear the echo of your cry. He knows your voice. You're going to learn his. He will be back. He will put you on his shoulders, and he'll carry you back. To the flock he's not going to chastise you he's not going to belittle you nor, nor is he going to shame you he may gently softly lovingly and maybe sternly say please don't do that again please learn from this time i love you too much to let you experience that please follow me here are four things i want to ask you to do if you want to i think as a church here's what we do we don't try to build up ministries and have ministries that are self-contained and they exist for the sake of themselves and the leaders that lead them. We try to do everything that we do, every single step to help you stay in relationship with Jesus. So here are the four things, and I'm going to read them off the notes because I want to finish, and I'm just going to say them. The first thing we ask you to do to stay in fellowship with Jesus is to get together and worship 
every week. Now, of course, you don't have to be here every week. I'm not saying to be legalistic about it, but this is a crucial part of that process, to gather together with God's people and to sing praise and to listen and be admonished and, and, to, and to be encouraged to go back out and follow hard after Jesus. We ask you to do another thing. We ask you to study the Bible together. There is, there, it is essential that you study the Bible individually, but it is rich, rich beyond compare when you study the Bible together with your spiritual family, with God's people and we ask you to be a part of that and thirdly we ask you to begin to develop close relationships with a small group of people with people that you can learn to build trust with the people that learn to know you to build community and that sense of togetherness to have that accountability in that group where where when tragedy strikes or triumph happens you have people that can be there and share that joy when ecclesiastes talks about weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice that's where we're aiming at with life groups we ask you to get in a life group plug in and share your journey we had one of the best life groups i think uh, we've ever had last week and it was rich because there's some real stuff going on the last thing i ask you that i think is essential is one-on-one -on -one relationship with a spiritual parent or to become a spiritual parent where you are accountable to somebody who looks you in the eye and asks you hard questions who answers hard questions with you who pursues the word of god with you and you sit down on a regular basis with somebody that you respect that leads you. I have that person in my life. I try to be that person for other people. And I'm telling you, I think it's essential. You want to walk with Jesus? Worship with us. Study the Word of God with us. Get in a life group and, 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 and then follow somebody's leadership as a mentor. Be a mentor and, and be mentored. That's it. Don't, don't, don't try to arrange the circumstances of your life so that there's going to be peace. Stay near the shepherd. And in his presence, he prepares a table even when the enemy looks on. And you get to sit down and say, oh, Jesus, I love you. Thank you. Let's pray. God, you are an amazing God. Your word astounds me and confounds me. And I love that about it. I'm so glad that that last year when I read a gospel that I read it this year and it's, while it's familiar, it's strikingly new and rich and deep. I want to thank you that your word has become your voice in my life. That it's become my counsel. That it is your rod. Thank you for searching my heart time and time again, plumbing the depths of my humanity with it exposing the things that need to be exposed, correcting the things that need to be corrected. Thank you for your word. To teach us today, right now, if you're going to prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies, if we're going to sit down and enjoy you, Jesus, we've got to look in your eyes, and we've got to stay in fellowship. Help us to do that. In Jesus' great name, amen. Church, I'm just going to say to you real quick, if you have got that situation going on where you know you've got to return. You know you're the sheep outside. Return today. You can return in your heart. You don't have to come down front. If you want to, we'd love for you to. If you want to pray with somebody, do that. But, but if, you're, if you're sitting there going, I don't know, I don't even know about Jesus. I don't even know what that means to have a relationship with Jesus. Please give us the chance to talk to you about that. Certainly you can come talk to me right now and we'll set up uh, a moment afterwards where we can visit at length or, or as long as you want to visit and answer questions or maybe a time this week. Maybe you want to shoot me an email or talk to one of our deacons or elders or, or staff people here, but we want you to know Jesus. We want you to come into relationship with him, the shepherd of your soul. We want you to have peace even when life is not peaceful because life is very seldom peaceful. But you can have joy and you can have peace in spite of all that. So let's stand and respond right now as God leads us, okay? Let's just respond however God speaks to you. You, you just respond right now and say yes.